He hikes his black robe up at the knee so he won't trip over it on the way up. His mouth is a little dry. He's cut himself shaving. He feels as if he's swallowed an anchor. If it weren't for the honor of the thing, he would just as soon be almost anywhere else. In the front pews, the old ladies turn up their hearing aids, and a young lady slips her six-year-old a lifesaver and a magic marker. A college sophomore, home from vacation, from vacation, who was there because he was dragged there, slumps forward with his chin in his hand. The vice president of a bank, who twice that week has seriously contemplated suicide, places his hymnal in the rack. A pregnant girl feels the life move inside her. A high school math teacher who for 20 years has managed to keep his homosexuality a secret for the most part, even from himself, creases his order of service down the center with his thumbnail and tucks it under his knee. The preacher pulls that little cord that they don't have in this church, <laughs> which turns on the lectern light and deals out his note cards like a riverboat gambler. The stakes have never been higher. Two minutes from now, he may have lost his listeners completely to their own thoughts, but at the minute, he has them in the palm of his hand. The silence in the church is deafening because everybody's listening to it. Everybody's listening, including even himself. Everybody knows the kind of things he's told them before and not told them. But who knows what this time, out of this silence, he will find to tell them. Let him tell the truth. Before the gospel is a word, it is silence. It is the silence of their own lives and of his life. It's life with a sound turned off, like the television with the sound turned off, so that for a moment you can experience it not in terms of the words you make it bearable by, but for the unutterable mystery that it is. Let him say, be silent and know that I am God, saith the Lord. Be silent and know that even by my silence and absence I am known. Be silent and listen to the stones cry out. Out of the silence, let the only real news come, which is sad news before it's glad news and that is a fairy tale last of all. The preacher isn't brave enough to be literally silent for long and since it is his calling to speak the truth with love, even if he were brave enough, he would not be silent for long because we're none of us very good at silence. It says too much. So let him use words, but in addition to using words to explain, to expound, to exhort, let him use them to evoke, to set us dreaming as well as thinking, to use words as at their most prophetic and truthful, the prophets use them to stir in us memories and longings and intuitions we starve for often without knowing that we starve. Let him use words which do not only try to give answers to the questions that we ask or ought to ask, but which help us to hear the questions that we do not have words for asking and to hear the silence that those questions rise out of and the silence that is often the answer to those questions. Drawing on nothing fancier than just the poetry of his own life, let him use words and images that help make the surface of our lives transparent to the truth that lies deep inside them, which is the wordless truth of who we are and who God is and the gospel of our meeting. I remember after that was sort of a quick run through of the first lecture and I remember after uh, it was over, or I guess before the next lecture began, I was, there was a group of Yale faculty gathered putting on their academic vestments and I was putting on mine and I heard some 
faculty member said to the other, what did he say yesterday? I couldn't make it. And the fellow said, he didn't say very much. <laughs> oh. So there it is, what I found to say. So let me now uh, say something about what I thought and still think. There's nothing, I, it's really the first time I almost can say I've read this since those ancient days, but there's nothing, it's not just reading it, because I still believe it. I still identify with it. So let me read you not only what I thought, but what I still think about the tragic, the dark dimension of our faith. The word of tragedy that Jesus himself speaks is, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. And then stop there, because I will give you rest, I will give you rest, is the word of comedy, and that comes later. All ye who labor and are heavy laden. Jesus speaks his word as tragedian, and the word floats free in the New Testament with no special event to moor it to and no special listener pictured as listening to it because it's addressed to anybody who will listen, and there is no event to which it does not speak. It floats loose so that it can find its mooring in any of us, anywhere. When he says, take up your cross and follow me, I think he's saying much the same thing, because before it means take up some special mission or some special sacrifice or responsibility, take up your cross means simply take up the burden of your own life. Because for the time being, anyway, maybe that is burden enough. Take it up, the burden of your own life, in the sense of touch it and taste it and listen to it. Look at yourself and at your own life and smell the smell of your mortality and your nakedness, all of you. Who are the poor naked wretches, as Lear calls them? Who are the ones that labor and are heavy laden? All ye, Jesus says, you all are. That is his tragic word to us. And his preachers must speak it after him if they are to be true to his truth. There are all kinds of preacher, pressures. There are all kinds of pressures on the preacher, both from within and from without, to be all kinds of other things, to speak all kinds of other words. To speak the truth with love is to run the risk always of speaking only the truth that people love to hear you speak. And the preacher's temptation, among others, is to deal with those problems only to which there is, however complex and hard to arrive at, a solution. The pressure on the preacher is to be topical and contemporary, to speak out like the prophets against injustice and unrighteousness. And it's right that he should do so, crucial that he should do so. And if he does not go to righteous action, he fails both God and man. But he must remember that the ones he is speaking to who beneath all the clothes they wear are the poor, bare, forked animals who labor and are heavy laden under the burden of their own lives, let alone of the world's tragic life. There's the one who can't stop thinking about suicide, the one who experiences his own sexuality as a guilt of which he feels he can never be absolved, the one whose fear of death is only a screen behind which he, hear, he hides his deeper fear of life. The one who is in a way crippled by her own beauty because it has meant that she has never had to be loving or human to be moved, to be loved, but only beautiful. And the angry one, the lonely one. For the preacher to be relevant to the staggering problems of history is to risk being irrelevant to the staggering problems of the ones who sit there listening out of their own histories. To deal with the problems to which there is a possible solution 
can be a way of avoiding the problems to which, humanly speaking, there really is no solution. When Jesus was brought to the place where his friend, Lazarus, lay dead, for instance, he did not offer any solution. He only wept. Then the other things he said and did. But first, he simply let his tears be his word. When the preacher spreads out his note cards like a poker hand, Maybe even the vacationing sophomore who was there only because somebody dragged him there pricks up his ears for a second or two with the rest of them because they believe that the man who was standing up there in a black gown with a little smear of styptic pencil on his chin has something, has something that they don't have. Or at least not in the same way he has it because he's a professional. He professes and stands for in public what they with varying degrees of conviction or the lack of it, subscribed to mainly in private. He's been to a seminary. He's studied all the things you study in a seminary. He has a degree to show for it. And beyond the degree, he has his ordination and the extraordinary title of reverend, which no matter how well they know him on the golf course or the cocktail party circuit, sets him apart as one to be revered, not because of anything he knows or anything he is in himself, but because as, an, uh, because as an ambassador is revered for the government he represents, he is to be revered for somehow representing Christ. All of this deepens the silence with which they sit there waiting for him to work a miracle. And the miracle they are waiting for is that he will not just say that God is present, because they've heard that said before, and it's made no great and lasting difference, will not just speak the word of joy, hope, comedy, because they've heard it spoken before too and have spoken it among themselves, but that he will somehow make it real to them. They wait for him to make God real to them through the sacrament of words, as God is supposed to come real in the sacrament of bread and wine. And there is no place where the preacher is more aware of his own nakedness and helplessness than here in the pulpit as he listens to the silence of their waking. Poor, bare, forked animal in his cassock or his preaching robe or his business suit, with his heart in his mouth, if not yet his foot, what can he say? What word can he speak with power enough to empower them waiting there? But let him take heart. He is called not to be an actor, a magician in the pulpit. He's called to be himself. He's called to tell the truth as he has experienced it. He's called to be human, to be human. And that is calling enough for any of us. If he does not make real to them the human experience of what it's like to cry into the storm and receive no answer, to be sick at heart and find no healing, then he becomes the only one there who seems not to have had that experience. Because most surely, under their bonnets and shawls and jackets, under their afros and ponytails, all the others there have had it, whether they talk about it or not. As much as anything else, it is their experience of the absence of God that has brought them there in search of God's presence. And if the preacher does not speak of that and to that, then he becomes like the captain of a ship who is the only one aboard the ship who either does not know that the waves are 20 feet high and the decks are wash, or will not face up to it so that anything else he tries to say by way of hope and comfort and empowering becomes suspect on the basis of that one crucial ignorance or disingenuousness or cowardice or reluctance to speak in love any truths but the ones that people love to hear. The absence of God. It's not just a 
I did conjure with. 